joys of Halloween. Good evening. My name is Kay, storyteller and caretaker of the House of Mystery. Oh, but of course you know the House of Mystery. It's that old dark ruin at the end of the street that you'd swear wasn't there the last time you looked. See what I mean? The house appears and vanishes of its own accord, collecting all that is terrifying and bizarre within its walls. Those who enter its doorway are forever changed by the experience, as those tykes over yonder will soon learn. <laughs> stand to look either. <laughs> you never know when a bloke needs to get into a spooky old house. Don't be scared, kiddies. After all, it was only a story. Still, if on some Halloween you pass by a spooky old house that wasn't there a moment before, please come in and say hello. from the crypt or the vault of horror. Much like its contemporaries, however, it had increasing scrutiny from the growing Comics Code Authority, which censored or refused to let comics be published with certain content, including elements of the supernatural. Unlike the EC Comics titles, however, House of Mystery endured, shifting its focus to science fiction and even superheroes. In the late 1960s, the book returned to horror with its host, Kane. Welcome, welcome to the Fivefold Understanding YouTube channel where censorship knows no bounds. Stay tuned in the next video. I'll provide more proof of that. Kane the Able Caretaker will not be with us for the foreseeable future. It is Halloween, so I'll take over in hosting narration responsibilities. He first appeared. In House of Mystery 174, when the mystery, the House of Mystery horror format, really began in 1968. And Kane would get really mad if I didn't mention his overweight brother Abel, who holds down the abode just across the way over there. You might have heard of it. The House of Secrets. The House of Secrets, I should say. Um, and what's more enduring than classic American horror and the host? They go hand in hand like M. Night Shyamalan and bad horror movies. One of the first, and according to many, arguably the best television horror host was this guy over here in the left corner, John Zacherly who in 1957 took a stint with Philadelphia Television Shock Theater as they rolled out a collection of then horror films being re released from Universal. Dressed in an undertaker's coat and sporting a ghoulish makeup with his hair parted down the middle, he portrayed Roland, 
the cool ghoul, who was the host of the show, and he lived in a crypt. You can see him over here. Uh, from Star A Shock Theater, famous monsters of Filmland, 1962. Um, other famous hosts include good old Uncle Creepy up here in your right corner. And yep, those are some Jack Davis drawings. He held down Creepy from Warren Publishing, comic book, magazine, uh, very mad-esque, you could say, with a horror twist to it. And I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but good old Abel here first appeared not in House of Secrets, nor in House of Mystery, but in DC Special number four. And if you don't know any of them, you sure know her, Vampirella, probably the queen of horror and the hosting responsibility, created by F.J. Ackerman and Trina Robbins. She was also the host of a, a sister Warren publishing vet publication, Vampirella, a black and white horror magazine. She first appeared just as winter dawned in 1969. And you gotta love that Vampirella outfit, right? Is there a better garb anywhere in fiction? Looking great, Vampirella. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, perhaps even my favorite host, Madam Xanadu, who first showed up in the Doorway to Nightmare. Uh, Mike Kaluta, Mike Kalata. Uh, am I saying his name right? He created this lovely, lovely character here, who you might even be familiar with from the Days of Vengeance Infinite Crisis prologue miniseries. And before we get back to the house of mystery and the rest of this DC Comics horror history micro doc documentary special, whatever you want to call this thing I'm putting together here, there's a couple other hosts I really need to mention before we move on because it just wouldn't be right. Not to mention them, that is.
lunatics went right for the jocular vein, with a combination of wicked wit and putrid puns that pushed the stories along to their gruesome conclusions. One of them even deserves credit for naming EC's most popular publication. It's got people with the crypt to use to say, Welcome to EC's Mad Mag Tales from the Crypt. See what I mean? The Galunatics. God forbid you don't mention them, right? Not to mention Elvira, who a lot of people think predated Vampirella. Not the case. And our host, Cain the Able Caretaker. And like you heard, in the 50s, some professor got up on a soapbox, had Senate uh, hearings commenced, and before you know it, there was a comic book code. Which put the EC boys out of business. Believe it or not, EC originally stood for Educational Comics. Now, isn't that irony? Allegorical irony at its finest. The same one could argue about the very first comic books, or more or less storybooks, were Victorian sensationalism called Penny Dreadfuls that featured vampires and characters like spring Jack, who was sometimes a good guy and sometimes the absolute worst of the worst. Believe it or not, the legend goes, he actually did <laughs> exist. But I should mention that the first actual horror comic was Eerie Comics. And it had quite a striking cover, too, over here on the left side. Depicting a strange-looking ghoulish man with, of course, a green cloak and a knife, damsel in distress. You know, typical Golden Age bondage cover laying there in some type of a ruin. Um, And unfortunately, like I said, it's a one-shot. There was no second issue. But sure enough, after the uh, EC Comics success, Crypt Keeper, Vault Keeper, you name it. They brought back the Eerie Comic series for 17 issues in 1951. The actual first horror comic book series was in the autumn of 1948 from American Comics Group, Adventures into the Unknown. Look at some of these covers. Are these gorgeous or what? And still today, they don't know who did a lot of the initial covers. You know, they argue back and forth. But you got to admit, they have a striking likeness. Or Francisco Francavalli has a striking likeness in what he's doing today to what was done way back in the fall of 48. And since this is a horror comics history, it'd be almost sacrilegious to mention the fact that Adventures into the Unknown lasted all the way up until 1967, which is quite phenomenal for any Golden Age comic book that wasn't part of the big two, outside of Fawcett publication, more or less. Beautiful, beautiful artwork, too. Castle O Tranato, 169 consecutive issues. And to some of you, maybe some of these scans look a little bit familiar. I'll be more than happy to show you. The free and open to the public, open domain, golden age comic book website, comic book plus. You guys come right here. You click on Categories. Anything you want, we'll click on Horror. They even have the Fawcett City publications here with Shazam and the entire Marvel family ready to read for you, a lot of which are scanned in beautiful 4K resolution. And they look at that. They have 147 comics, almost all of the 169 American Comics Group, you click on the comics. 
And this is pretty cool. For anybody who's a Golden Age comics enthusiast or likes classic horror, sure, some of it's a bit campy, but a lot of it's really cool. You've seen some of the artwork. Absolutely fabulous, phenomenal stuff. And there you have it. <laughs> Just like that, you pick your issue. Do, 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 do. Look at them all. Like I said, they have the majority of these right here. We'll just click on a random one and see what happens. Yeah, and don't think you're pirating or whatnot coming here, because that is not the case. The whole setup here is just phenomenal. What do they call it? The, the UI, the user interface, is done really, really well here. Because I think if you just tap the middle, see if it works. Yep, look at that. You tap the middle, and it goes page by page for you. Is that not awesome or what? Please come and take advantage of the Comic Book Plus website and let these guys know how awesome of a job they have done here the um the collections and the categories the comic books are immense or perhaps i should say there was an immense supply the first house of mystery comic came out in 1951 and it wasn't so much horror genre as it was science fiction twilight zone-esque Because back then, nobody knew what magic was soon to be unleashed on the comic book world. The aforementioned EC comic book trilogy, we could call it, which was then unleashed under the world, causing the comic book code authority to come down on everybody. DC Comics had one response. And that was to bring the superheroes back one more time. This time with a more scientific-based edge to them. And along with it came a whole new slew of artists. Including a man by the name of Carmine Infantino. Who's most notably known for his flash work. Drew one of my favorite all-time covers right here. Strange Adventures number six, I believe it is. First appearance and origin of Captain Comet. Is that a cover or is that a cover? Wow. Carmine vastly became a legend. And with his growing success, DC wanted to keep him around when Marvel offered him $22,000 raise as an art director. After what I'm assuming was probably a short bidding war between DC Comics and Marvel, Carmine stayed with DC after he got his promotion. They put him in an editorial position, and they said to him, go get some assistant editors, some guys who are filled with ideas. Lo and behold, guess who he found? Comic Book's original gangster, Joe Orlando, who had just been coming off some Daredevil success after creating The Purple Man. And check out this Joe Orlando cover right here. Is that not spooky or what? Look at that. Flower Man. Joe was also noted at DC for creating the Inferior Five and in Showcase Presents, the aforementioned Purple Man, and I believe it was Daredevil number four over at Marvel, and those wonderful Sea Monkey ads we all remember so fondly. You can thank good old Joe for all of it. In 1997, 
late 97, early 98, Joe was interviewed, and I'll quote him here. I had been freelancing for 16 years, and although I was successful, it was a tough way to make a living. I found myself working seven days a week, 16 hours a day, and when you're freelancing, you don't want to turn anything down or you might lose a client. So you keep on taking all the jobs you're offered and juggling deadlines, stressing out, and never taking a vacation. I found that I was very happy to take an editorial job at DC when asked. In the early day, in the early Jim Warren issues of Creepy, which he also edited, Carmine was fond of and knew about, and he asked him if he'd work for DC as an editor. He said he'd considered it. He asked me before it was known that he himself, Carmine, was to become editorial director. So Joe, or I should say, as I am Joe, wasn't sure if he was pulling my leg. Fortunately, he had confined in somebody else about his promotion, and I had heard about it through a fellow artist. When he asked me the second time, I was sure Carmine was serious. Now I knew this was a serious offer, and I jumped at it. Unquote. And jump at it, he did, unleashing a bevy of horror titles over the next few years onto the comic book landscape, spinner racks, and newsstands across the country. Along with this classic, classic cover here that most mistakenly think Joe uh, Neil Adams drew. Oh no, this was all Joe Orlando's work. Do you dare enter the house of mystery? And like that, the mystery format began with issue 174. And with the green light from both Carmine Infantino and DC Comics, he created what became the legendary House of Mystery Brain Trust, captained by gangster Joe Orlando, Jack Sparling, eventually a young Bernie Wrightson, as well as then a young, very young Len Wein, Michael Kaluta, per, and perhaps two of comic book's greatest cover artists, Neil Adams and Nick Cardi. I'll show you some Nick Cardi work here momentarily. And some of you might already be familiar with his work. Aquaman, the Silver Age Aquaman series. All those covers were predominantly drawn by Nick himself. And if Len Wein over there in the left corner looks familiar to anybody, creator of Swamp Thing, the new X-Men, Colossus Storm and them, as well as one of the best Justice League villains of all time, Libra, reference Final Crisis Secret Files, the ballad of Justin Ballantine, how he grew up in a Starman classroom on a college campus, is quite a good comic book. And how could I forget Len also created Wolverine. And although he was used or although he created a lot of characters, he was actually used himself in a creation. He is the original template for Kane. Sort of an inside DC Comics offices joke. Another Hall of Fame House of Mystery mystery man, Sergio Aragones, penciled more than a few comic books in his time. The reason I bring this up is, if you read a Wikipedia, and maybe even if you read, uh, or if you read an Overstreet, you take a look at the Wikipedia, it's going to tell you, you know, Kane was created by uh, Joe Orlando. And, you know, it goes on and on. Well, the actual truth of the matter is it was Steve Skeets up here who first brought the idea, was shopping around the ideas of the poster plague when Joe Orlando had been uh, figuring out a way to switch House of Mystery and fight back against the comic book code authority. And when he seen the ideas for the poster plague characters that later Sergio Aragones put in the pages of Plop, 
That was the real origin of both Cain and Abel. in that they were Steve Skeet's ideas before any talented artist fleshed them out on a piece of paper. And as the new House of Mystery format dawned, the world was never the same. And although 174 is considered where the mystery monster horror format begins it was right here in issue 175 that was actually the original horror comic book in its entirety because i believe issue 174 only featured one last story that had the horror framework check out some of these neil adams covers they're absolutely mouth-wateringly awesome. I mean, you just can't say enough about this guy and these covers. Look at these. And this right here is a very noteworthy uh, issue and that because it's master, master illustrator Bernie Wrightson's first comic book artwork, who in my opinion is probably the best single pencil, pencil artist I ever seen. I want to say like the first 15 issues were all done by Neil Adams. The majority initially was done by Adams. And this one here has got a real, real creepy, creepy uh, Victorian antiquities onk product type of setting. As these kids examine this sarcophagus. A common theme in these horror covers is always... People and children in peril. <laughs> Wild, huh? These kids are up in the attic when his little friend happens to escape and fall into an antique mirror. There's brilliant, brilliant minds behind this stuff. These guys walk into some sort of demonic ritual. I don't know if that's a gateway that just opened up or some farm shed deep, deep in the woods. Some hunting blind shack. Really special stuff. Adam's penciled the... Excuse me, Adams penciled the first 13 issues. These kids here hiding underneath the bed. 175 through 192, as well as 197, 199, 251 through 254. All of which were penciled by cover artist extraordinaire, Neil Adams. Look at that, you see the hoof prints around the bed. And some vaulted ceiling. House of Mystery. And that's another thing about the House of Mystery. The rooms were always supposedly ever-changing. And as it served, obviously, for the name of a comic book, it served a much more grandiose purpose. It was both a transformative vehicle in itself and a vehicle to carry you. I mean, this thing literally moved as we've seen in the introduction. And you got Pan the Goat God here. The physical origin of, of Satan, anyhow. And the pitchfork staff usually comes from the uh, Greek gods, Hades and Poseidon where the trident comes from and now this here is a house of secrets cover you really got to appreciate the uh gothic romance here i mean if i could get this in a three inch thick frame i mean i'd hang it right in the living room 
And I want to say this is by Nick Cardi. He did some really, really phenomenal work. I'll have to show you some of that stuff. And this here is another Neil Adams uh, House of Secrets cover. And this is very noteworthy because I believe it's the very first painted cover by Neil Adams, if I'm not mistaken. And if it looks familiar to anybody, House on the Hill. Well, this one has a definite Gothic romance feel to it. But if you just look at the template for it, I'm sure y'all going to recognize now, right? Recognize it now, if not before. It's that same theme used way back in Detective Comics 31 by Bob Kane. Uh, and that's a very special hallmark DC comic where Batman actually pulls out a gun and kills the vampire man inside of his castle. And I believe it's almost that castle and the template for it that kind of becomes the house of mystery. And as you can see there, Adams right here in the middle, Batman 227, did a beautiful swipe of it. And that's another famous cover. And then he did it over uh, on the right here. He did it again at the end of Detective Comics New 52. And we had spoke earlier about Nick Cardi. And since we're doing horror comic books, these are some of the best, in my opinion. Look at that House of Secrets cover. It's got a very, very Game of Thrones feel to it with the skeletons coming out of the ice. The ice princess being traced, chased by skeleton hockey madmen with wooden sticks. And right here in the middle, the very first Witching Hour comic. And now what's interesting to note about this is I'll have to go show you the other one. But uh, a lot of these covers are duo-dimensional, where you can see two things happening in the same story setting. Two different views of it. But here you got the castle in the background with a giant harvest moon behind it. And the young Victorian there walking around with the searchlight looking for his family. And the witch posted high up on the chimney knows exactly what happened to his family. I'm going to have to show you the other view of this. And then over here on the right, one of my favorite, favorite Secrets of Sinister House covers. Another gothic romance cover by uh, Nick Cardi. You know, a more classic, what would you maybe even call it button-up horror. You know, not this slasher flick gone wild madness. You know, a little more taste to it. Perhaps drier, but a lot more richer in story. And speaking of Sinister House, or the Secrets of Sinister House, it probably should be noted that the Sinister House of Secret Love, which has, once again, a very strong gothic romance feel to it over here on the left. And I love that emblem way up there in the left corner. That little logo, you could see that on a t-shirt, huh? Uh, House of Mysteries transformation from being a science fiction superhero title into a horror title, you know, it was much more seamless due to the name and the fact that this House of Mystery could be so much more. And a lot of titles just switched their They essentially right here took the love out of it. You got to get the love out of that title. It ain't selling. And thus became it became Secrets of Sinister House. And you see here in the middle some of the uh, really, really well done Alex Toth artwork that you find inside of that first issue there to your left. And like the secret sinister and like the secret house of sinister love, there also was the dark mansion of forbidden love. So there was two similar titles. Both of them had uh, name changes, and and once again here you see uh, a, a un just I can't you know it's ineffable I can't even think of a word for it how just l lovely it it's just spooky and lovely at the same time another Nick Cardi all three of these are Nick uh, Nick Cardi and sometimes it's pronounced Nick Cardi with an I too um, I don't I didn't actually do research on that but. 
this witching hour cover here in the middle. Is that something or what? That's more classic horror with the witch. Just waiting in the darkness to snatch up this victim. Uh, and framework here by once again two really exceptional Nick Cardi gothic romance covers. You gotta love these. They're just so it's got so much class to them. They really do. And since we're on the subject of Nick Cardi, I'm going to show you how uh, it's a dual dimensional cover that takes place in the same uh, story setting here with the witch watching the young Victorian down there. She's posted high up on the chimney. This is another Witching Hour cover. That was number one. This is number five. And you can see this is just the other perspective, perhaps of that young Victorian, you know, looking up or not looking up. And this old man is, you know, his shutters are, are, are banking off the wood paneling in the wind. And he opens the window to say, young man, you'll find your family tomorrow. It's 12 o'clock. Go home. It's the Witching Hour. I just thought that was brilliant how these covers definitely connect. You see that? I mean, that's really special. And something else I should notice, how hard it is to find a lot of these Witching Hour covers, especially, even House of Mystery as well, in good condition. They're very, very hard to find. Uh, nice, it's hard to find nice copies of these. And this one here is another really special cover, number seven. Just constantly being erupted here. But yeah, it was a very, very special time. You know, whether it's the House of Mystery or this dark foreboding castle. It's always right there in the background. And here's your smoke monster decades before Lost, huh? Pretty special Neil Adams cover right here. And before we get a little too sidetracked, this one, House of Mist or uh yeah, House of Mystery 199, huge, huge Game of Thrones vibes here, huh? Uh the White Walkers. Look at that. I almost guarantee you George R. R. Martin has a copy of this. This might even have subconsciously spawned that idea. Think about it. Neil Adams could literally be responsible for a good part of Game of Thrones. There's again Castle in the background, perhaps the House of Mystery. It's a very special time. Another Neil Adams cover here. Look at how scared that kid looks. It looks almost looks like a young Tom Brady, doesn't it? Look at that. <laughs> That's funny, huh? He caught the doll beating up his best friend. Look at this. What are they doing to this guy? Look at his face. My God. And whatever this doll's doing is like he's unzipping his pants or something. This guy's about to hit it. Spooky, spooky cover. I never looked at this one in that much detail till now. Wow, huh? Now, Michael Kalut is another one I need to mention before I uh, wrap this up. Although this wasn't such a great scan, this cover here is just really special. Got the whole people underneath the stairs vibe to it. Such a beautiful coloring job too, huh? Just a perfect coloring job on this comic. It really, really is the best era for comic book covers, to say the very least. You know, bar none, nothing compares to this. The, uh, the consistency of it is just really, really mind-blowing. And that's another thing. Uh, the Mike Kaluta covers, most of them have a very, very ritualistic, you know, satanic feel to them. I mean, look at these ones. All pretty much right in that same file, you know? The 
from Mr. Doorway to Nightmare, that is, as well. And last, but definitely, definitely not least, Bernie Wrightson, who recently passed. He did a Frankenstein story. Uh, it's probably farther back than I remember, but he couldn't finish it, and he had Kelly Jones finish it. Um, I think it's Frankenstein Unbound or... God, I want to say it was a Dark Horse publication, but that's something everybody needs to check out. Definitely check out the Kelly Jones, Bernie Wrightson, Frankenstein miniseries. And this right here, like I said, Len Wein created Swamp Thing in his head. Bernie Wrightson drew it up on paper. You know, you could argue Nick Cardi, Neil Adams. They're better cover artists, but are they better all-around artists? I don't really think so. This guy could really draw. And here's a few more from Wrights. And these are all the more noteworthy ones, perhaps. First appearance on the, of the Swamp Thing over here in the right. You know, big, big high-demand book. So to a degree is the weird because it's got the black cover, the demon showing up on top of the pentagram, squashing the people during the seance or whatever they were doing. Uh, that there is hard to find in good condition. You know, it's a fat, fat comic with the black cover. Fingerprints mark it up very, very easily. And I'm happy I own two out of the three. And over there, bat out of hell. I used to think that was like a Batman, and actually it's a giant bat attacking a man. Nevertheless, all very, very special stuff right here. Just really fun to look at, especially right now. You know, it's Halloween. Perfect time to look at this era of comics. The Bronze Age really came in like a bull, huh? And thank God Joe Orlando and those boys all showed up. Otherwise, we would have got stuck with more of this right here, and the title probably would have been canceled. This Dial H for Hero, this happens just prior to all that unbelievably awesome stuff we were just looking at. Um, and the interesting thing here to note is that little dial that Robbie Reed has is used to conjure up new superheroes. And this goes back to House of Mystery 156, where Dial H makes its first appearance. It ran all the way up until Joe Orlando's takeover. We pretty much went over all that. And it's noteworthy to mention that in issue 160. Uh, I think it's 160. Yep, there. it's hard for me to see it. First Silver Age Plastic Man appearance. I felt that, you know, that needed to be, needed to be noted in the historical annals of House of Mystery. And as things started to wind down a decade later, once again, the Bronze Age ended, and it was time for change once again. House of Mystery unleashes I Vampire onto the world. I, Vampire, was sort of the close of the curtains for the House of Mystery title. First appeared in 290, and in 318, I believe, was the last I, Vampire story in general. 
almost 40 issues, or th excuse me, 29 issues of I, Vampire, I believe, virtually concludes the tour of the House of Mystery, not prior to a couple other things that happened. Uh, this Jaja Binks 35 channel does a really nice job of presenting comic books, especially when he does House of Mystery ones. Go over there and maybe show him some love. You can read the entire thing there. In conclusion, the Magical House of Mystery, Volume 1 anyhow, went 321 monthly comics over the better part of 32 glorious years. The house, although did find itself featured elsewhere during the time period we visually took a tour of, as a featuring act in the pages of DC Comics Presents number 53 and 19, 83 issue, as well as a limited collector's edition comic, C23, on the left side of your screen over there, from 1973, as well as a DC Special Series 21, Festive Holiday Spring Special, those last two being reprints, and that one's not featured here. And who could ever forget, on the far right of your screen, the Red Water and Crimson Death story from 1970 issue of Brave and the Bold, number 93, written by Batman, long-tenured custodial engineer, Danny O'Neill. And as you can see, it featured the trademark, Neil Adams, swipe cover, from Joe Orlando's original House of Mystery 174, being homage there one last time. This here being the final issue of the House of Mystery itself from the original volume. There's Kane with the for sale sign up. He's got his bags packed and we're uh, framework there on the borders by uh, more unforgettable. Bernie writes and pencils. Just could stare at this stuff all day long. And then it was a few years later, House of Mystery reached an all new depth, <laughs> you could say. I didn't read it, that's how I understand it. Some people like it, from what I hear. They didn't like it too much. Was Elvira took over for 10 issues, 10 issue House of Mystery uh, miniseries where Elvira, I don't know if she took over the role of Kane or what, actually, but these are probably more readily available, 1986 through 87. And even when you can't find good House of Mystery comics, DC usually puts out, I'd say, one every other year or something. This year we got a couple of good ones. I got them over here in the corner. Actually, I didn't pick up the Curse Comics Cavalcade, but I didn't read my Young Monsters in Love yet or my DC House of Horror from last year. I was out of town. And then the Walmart special recently came out. Uh, it's all reprints. Everybody hates it. Like, it's all reprints. So what? You get 100 pages for 5 bucks, and who reads everything anyway? And plus, it's got a feature cover story of, uh, you know, Batman New 52 Owls artist Greg Capullo doing Swamp Thing. And I cannot say enough about the comic in the upper right corner of your screen, the Infinite Halloween special. If anybody can find that, and I'd say it's under 15 bucks, it's got to be in good condition. Buy it, because in that book is an unforgettable Aquaman story. One of the best single horror stories I ever read. A uh, short one with Aquaman. Definitely, definitely mentionable. Outside of that, I hope everybody has a happy Halloween. I hope y'all enjoyed the show. A tour of the House of Mystery DC Comics Horror History. But before I go, I should mention that 15 years later, after the house or so everyone thought closed up for good, uh... The original series was grabbed up by Vertigo, which was a branch of DC, 
And in 1998, they put out a double size one shot, which you're looking at right here on the screen, that featured 12 or 13 stories, including materials from the classic House of Mystery 186 comic, as well as that plot number one with some stories drawn by Sergio Aragones that we talked about earlier. Plus, it had a new framing story featuring Kane himself, written by Neil Gaiman. I've never came across this comic anywhere, but if I ever do, I'm going to buy it and I'll let y'all know what I think about it. Outside of that, and then 2009, um, Vertigo starts an actual House of Mystery series Bedrooms and Boredom, and I know you can get the first trade of this for $9.99, like Vertigo usually does with all their uh, volume ones. God, you know, how can you beat that? If you're in a comic book shop and they ain't got none of that other stuff we just got done looking at, definitely pick up the first volume of this for $10. Bucks. You won't be disappointed. It's uh, written by Bill Willingham and Matthew Sturges. I think Willingham did the scripts. Matthew Sturgis does most of the writing, and a lot of the pencils, the main part of the pencils are done by Luca Rossi, the Italian artist, not the novelist, who shares the same name. And with that being said, subscribe to the Fivefold Understanding YouTube channel. I want everybody to have a happy, happy Halloween. And I'm going to uh, let uh, Link Akara here atop the fourth wall, or is it the, the evil long box or something? I'll let this guy here take us out. The links will be in the description eventually. So anybody mentioned in this video will be down there if you guys want to look at it in further detail. And with all that being said, I'll let this crazy madman take us out of here. The saga continues. Why can she talk to houses? And who is the 